Okay, welcome back. This is a turning point in the semester. From this point forward, we're going to do a lot more talking about some of the more conceptual, higher level concerns in computer science. And this is really what distinguishes you from people out there in the world that have just learned how to hack. This is what makes you a computer scientist as opposed to just a computer programmer. Is the concepts and the ideas that we're going to start talking about today and continue talking about for the next roughly two months. So at the same time, this is going to provide us with a lot of opportunities to practice with our imperative programming skills and with our object-oriented programming skills as well. So that's the plan. Starting today, today we'll introduce this idea, we'll start talking about how we analyze algorithms, the kind of things we look for, the way that we talk about their behavior, the type of concerns we have when we evaluate them and, and compare them to each other. And then throughout the next coming weeks, we'll be designing algorithms and data structures together to do things like sort, to do things like search, to do a variety of different operations on data structures like lists and trees. And these things sound simple, but they are really sort of the basic building blocks and the backbone of what all of the rest of computer science is built on. Even a primitive as simple as sorting turns out to be incredibly powerful and useful. And still, a problem that people are working on today. There's actually, I was very pleased to discover when I started teaching this class that modern languages actually have started to uh, provide an, uh, the default sort implementation is actually something new. It's only a couple years old. It's an algorithm called TimSort, named after Tim, who invented it. Um, we'll talk about that in a few weeks. Okay. But today, let me start off by doing just a little bit of review, as always, since we can talk about the quiz now. This was one of the questions on quiz six that troubled people more than other questions, and it troubles me that it troubled people. Um, so this gave you a little bit of code. I've omitted some of the, the, the car class that was just kind of there to show you how this worked. Uh, but the main body of, of the code is down here in the main method of the example class. And, the, and the, this, this question really comes down to understanding object references, which was something that we've talked about a few times. So when this, one, one first way to think about this is, when this code runs, how many car objects get created? How many times is the constructor called? How many times is new going to be called? Jeremy. One, I see it up here on line 13. Now it's a little tricky because I see new on line 12, but what is line 12 creating? Line 12 is creating an array of references to cars. No actual cars have been created at that point. Instead, what Java has done is created an array that can hold references to car objects. The only car that's actually created here is the car created on line 13. So the first loop from line 15, sorry, from line 14 to 16 goes through, and it copies, it essentially sets up the array so that all of the references in the array are referring to the same car. That's the only car that they could possibly refer to because there's only one car in the universe at this point. Then the loop from line 17 to 19 goes through, and calls this function increase mileage. So the car's mileage starts off at 10, that's the argument that's passed to the constructor, and then every time I call the increase mileage call on line 18, I'm calling it on a different slot in the array. But all of those references refer to the same object. So there's only one car here. So the first time, I increase the mileage of that one car from 10 to 11. The second time from 11 to 12. When the loop finishes, I've increased it 10 times. There were 10 cars, references in the array, only one car in the world. So when I'm finished, car zero odometer is going to print 20. And in fact, no matter what I chose for I, system.out.println is going to print 20. So let's look at this in our little Example playground, indeed. And again, I can change this to four, 
I can change it to nine. As long as it's a valid slot in the array, it's going to print the same value. The reason for that is that these are all the same car object. Let's prove that to ourselves. Let's try this. Let's just print the car itself, and then we'll print another car in the array. I have not overridden two strings, so I'm getting the default object implementation of two string, which consists of the name of the class followed by something that looks like either a hash code or a memory address. And you can see it's the same. It's the same because these are actually two references to the same car. If, let's, let's try this. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna change the problem a little bit. Now I've created 10 different cars because inside the loop, for every reference in the array, I'm, I'm creating a different car. Now, if I do, let's do this. Let's change it a little bit differently per car so we can see the difference. What am I doing? I'm sorry. I'm a little foggy this morning. Still a little foggy. Oh. Mm, okay, that's fine. Let's just, how about we go through the first half of the array? There we go. Okay? So now what am I doing? Now I'm actually creating 10 different cars, and now my second array is only going through the first half of the array and increasing the mileage. And so now if I look at the odometer on car zero, it's the first car in the array, it's only been incremented once, and if I pick a car from the second half of the array, it's never been incremented. And you can see when I print off the car references in the array, they're actually different. Questions about this example? This is a very, very important concept to master. I would encourage you, if you need to, you know, draw some pictures of some of these examples. We have some examples of diagrams showing how references work from the previous slides, and you can certainly apply them to this example. They get a little bit messy, which is why they're not on the slides, but you can go through and say, okay, I've got a bunch of an array, and that array has references in it, and all the references point to the same car, and, and kind of convince yourself of what's happening here. Okay, good. Another question from the quiz. So this was another one that asked you to return to manipulate or think about object references. So essentially, I asked you to create a class with a static method that takes two arguments. The first is the number of references to create. So I'm returning an array that's going to re uh, consist of references to all objects. And I've asked you to create a certain number in the first parameter. And then the second parameter says, if it's true, I'm trying to remember what the semantics are. If it's false, they should return, you should return an array filled with references to different instances of all. And if it's true, they should all refer to the same instance of all. So let's walk through how to do that. So I need a class called all. I need a, this is gonna return our array of references. I'm not gonna worry about handling the edge cases here, but you, you could do that. So I need an array. So I need the, the array that I need, to, I need to create the array that I'm gonna return. So I'm gonna say return array is equal to new all size. So I know how big the array is gonna be. And again, if the size was negative one, you'd have to, to handle that or whatever. And now I've got two different cases. So if I'm supposed to create new references for every slot, I'll handle these separately. I don't think we asked you to create any sort of special constructor for this method, for this class or anything, so I can just use the default empty constructor. I'm going through the array, filling it with references to new all objects. So new is gonna be called whatever the, the uh, length of the array is. 
Otherwise, I'm supposed to fill it with references to the same object. So what I'm gonna do to do that is I'm gonna create that outside the loop. And then I'm gonna go borrow this loop from up here. I'm gonna set every value of it to this one object instance. So again, in the top case, new gets called inside the loop. So as I'm looping over, I'm creating a new instance of all every time the loop executes. Bottom case, new gets called once. As I go through the loop, I'm copying the one reference I have to that one object into the array. So in the first case, you know, every instance of the array has a reference to a different, every slot in the array is a reference to a different instance of all. In the second example, Every slot in the array is a reference to the same instance of all, that one that I created outside. Questions about this as well? The first data structure that we talk about this semester is gonna be lists, and that will give you some practice with working with references. That's one of the reasons that we do it. Okay. So let's pick up where we left on Friday, because we're gonna finish this conversation about interfaces before we launch into talking about algorithms because this is an important distinction to get right. So remember that interfaces, one of the many things that they do is they provide a boundary between two different parts of your code, two different, you know, projects that could be worked on entirely independently. And at that boundary, we need agreements about how things are going to work. So the interface on some level represents a contract between the provider of the interface that agrees to implement a, sequ a series of methods and to have them do the thing that the description of the method says they should do, and then the user of the interface, which then gets to utilize the methods that the class provides and is gonna do something useful. And the nice thing, again, about these interfaces is that's all that these two components need to agree on in order to interoperate. As long as you implement compare to properly, I can use it, right? And I don't have to care about how you implement it, as long as it does whatever was, you know, described in the spec. So let me show you how cool this is, okay? So here's a little example. What I'm doing is I'm creating an array of strings. And we're gonna, we're gonna do something else with this in a minute. But for now, I'm creating an array of strings. And then I've declared the method signature for a static method on this class called maximum that takes an array of objects that implement the comparable interface. So these are objects that I can call compare to on. And the goal here is to find the maximum value. So does anyone remember how we do that? This is not that different than when we've done this in the past. We've done the max over an array of integers. So now we're gonna generalize this concept and allow uh, our code to find the maximum value of anything that can be compared. So how do I do this? Does anyone remember the general outline of this, of finding the maximum value? Yeah. Right. So let's, let's ignore the cases, and you'll have to handle these on today's homework where you're gonna do a very similar problem. But for now, let's ignore the cases where values is null or empty. Normally, we'd have to worry about those. But instead, we're going to say, okay, the current maximum, the largest value I've ever seen, is the first value in the array. So that's at position zero. And now, I'm gonna go through the rest of the array. I'm gonna look at every other element. And what I'm gonna ask myself is, is this element bigger than the maximum value that I've seen so far? So when I did this with integers, what did we do? We essentially said if values i was greater than current max. This is not going to work anymore because I don't have integers, I don't have a primitive type, I actually have an object. There's some languages where you can actually override these comparison operators to make this work, which is kind of wild, right? So there's some languages that essentially allow you to say, if you put 
you know, a, a greater than between two objects, I will actually call some method on those objects to compare them. But Java doesn't do that, which is sort of nice, actually, because this can get really scary and mysterious very quickly. So I can't do this. If I try to write, run this code, it's not going to compile. Mm -hmm. It's also angry about something else, but that's okay. We'll fix that later. Oh, sorry. Strings. Not. I changed the name. Actually, let's change this back to values, because they're not going to be strings forever. Yep, there we go. So it says, I can't apply this operator. So what do I do instead? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the power of interfaces. I know because I'm accepting an array of things that are comparable that I can call this method. And I'm gonna forget how to use it, so someone is gonna tell me, remind me, so I'm going to call compare to, and I'm going to compare it to the current max. And can someone remind me what the semantics of compare to are? I can look them up, too. Yeah. Okay. So we have a claim from the audience. So this, may, this may or may not be true. We'll test it in a minute, right? That this is the way to do it. So essentially, compare to returns a positive value if the object that's called on is greater than the object that's passed as an argument. So this is the equivalent of what I had just written with the greater than symbol. It's just the way to do it with objects that implement comparable. So I say, okay, I'm comparing it to the current max. If that returns a positive number, then what do I do? is very similar in many ways to what I would do if I was comparing integers or doubles. So the current value is bigger than the maximum I've seen so far, yep. Bingo, replace the maximum value. When I'm done, I'm gonna replace, return the current maximum. And I, well, I think that's correct. Okay. So I've called this on the strings one, two, and three. The string that gets returned as the maximum is two. Why is that? Let me try putting another value in here so we can see what's happening. Oops. Sorry, new string. So string implements compare to. How does it implement compare to? Based on this example, what is it doing? Yeah. Yeah, this is using, like, lexicographic order, alphabetical order, as you might call it. So Z, Z, Z sorts to the end because it starts with the letter Z. I wonder what happens if I put a number in here, like one. Okay, one must sort to the front. Yeah. Okay. So let me show you why this is so cool. We just implemented this method down here. There is no reference to strings in this method at all. This method has nothing to do with strings. This method is implemented on comparables. So I've showed you how I can now find the maximum of a bunch of integers, or strings. Let's change the type. So this is unfortunately using an I, something that we haven't talked about yet, but Briefly, for every primitive type, Java provides what's called a boxing type, which is an object that you can use to wrap that primitive type. So in this case, capital integer is an object that wraps an, the primitive type int. We'll talk about this in a couple of lectures. But for now, you can think of this as just holding an integer value. And I initialize it by passing an integer value, the difference between this and an int is that this is an object, therefore it has methods like compare to. Integer implements compare to. So if I've done my maximum properly, and I have, I have now computed the maximum over a bunch of integers. So again, this little bit of code that we wrote will now run on 
any Java class that implements comparable. And there are many. So this is the power of this type of abstraction. This is the power of interfaces. This is this generality that you get. I don't have to worry about how the string class implemented compare to, or how integer implements compare to, although in the case of integer, it makes a lot of sense. It's just, you know, ordered based on the, the value of the int that, that this object wraps. Any class that implements comparable can now be passed to my maximum method, and it will work correctly. Because the only thing that it's relying on is this compare to method and the semantics associated with compare to. So for example, you might think about if an object didn't implement compare to properly. Let's say it got things flipped around, like I did on one of the homework problems last week. And instead of returning a positive value in the if statement, it returns a negative value. In that case, my code isn't going to work properly, but it's really your problem if you, Im if you implemented that class. So for this to work correctly, it relies on two things. One is that there's a meaningful comparison between those objects, and that's what it means to implement comparable. I'm indicating that there's a way to order two objects of that particular type. And this code also relies on you implementing compare to properly according to the spec. So the spec says if, you know, the value that's passed in is greater than the object that it's called on, return a positive value, and my code is now relying on it. Questions about this? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, I mean, those could be, that, that could be implemented wherever. So the question was, does it matter where the maximum method goes within the class? No, I, I could put it on top. Yeah, I know we've been usually doing it on top. I don't know why it's here. Just something different today. Yeah. I heard something that sounded like a question, but I don't think it was. Okay, good, wait, yeah. Ah, so the question is, can I compare multiple objects with different types? Uh, not usually. That usually doesn't make sense, right? I usually want to, I'm going to compare an object with another object of the same type or something that descends from that, right? So something that can be safely upcasted to that type. Right now, I haven't shown you how to make that work properly, but we will get there. This is why you're getting that error when you submit the homework about using unchecked or unsafe operations. Java does have a way to do this, um, but I don't want to get into it today. Okay. Last call for questions about references, objects, interfaces. More practice on that this week. Jeremy. So basically, the provider is an object. The provider is an object based on the type of type. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly correct. So, so the statement was that a provider is a class that implements the interface by providing implementations for the methods in the interface according to the specification. So in this example, who's the provider of comparable that I'm using? Integer. Integer provides the comparable interface. For this example, if I changed it to string, which I just did, then string would provide comparable. I can't call this on every object in Java. I can only call it on ones that implement comparable. So if I tried to create a Java object that didn't implement comparable and pass it to this function, it wouldn't work. It would fail at compile time, actually, because the compiler would say, you can't pass, you can't cast something that doesn't implement a particular interface to that interface, and so it would, would not work. So what I'm showing you here, so last week we looked at, we had you implement an interface. So we gave you an interface and we said, you're now the provider, implement this. This is an example of, a, of code that's using an interface. So my code is using the comparable interface to allow me to compare two objects without caring about what kind of object they actually are. So that's the real power of this is that I have now just created code, my little, you know, seven-line function that can run on thousands of different Java objects and compute the maximum properly. This code is correct, and it will work, again, with large numbers of Java objects as long as they implement comparable. Yeah, okay. 
So I want to, so let me talk a little bit about, wait, was there a question? How do I know if an object implements comparable? How does the com how does the com well it, it, is is the user of the as the provider of the interface or yeah so the question is how do I know if an object implements comparable I don't I don't have Java doc here if you look up the Java doc for a particular class it'll tell you what interfaces it implements. Yeah, so if I, if I want to look up, like, you know, there's certain classes where you just kind of assume they're going to implement comparable. So, for example, there's a wrapper class for doubles. Would it implement comparable? Yeah, of course, right? You know, in other cases, you know, I was actually looking up all the classes that implemented comparable. There's some things that make sense, like there's classes in Java for storing dates and times. Those all implement comparable, right? Because that makes sense. It's like I can put two months in order, right? There were other things on that list that I was a little surprised by. Good question. All right, so let me uh, talk about what's happening over the next couple weeks as far as us wrapping up um, our object-oriented program. So as a reminder, our second midterm, midterm one, is next week. So we have one more quiz this week on objects. This will be primarily on interfaces and inheritance. You can definitely expect to be asked to implement an interface. You can definitely be expected to uh, use an interface. Um, next week, midterm one, object-oriented program. Start to finish. That's what, that's what it's gonna focus on. In the meantime, we're gonna be talking about other stuff in class. We might stop and do, you know, one lecture for midterm review. In general, I wanna get started talking about algorithms and, and other ideas. We will continue to practice with these concepts, but here's where we're going next couple weeks. Jeremy. This one will, yeah. So this midterm will focus primarily on the, the object-oriented programming. Anything's fair game, right? But, you know, it's weighted towards the stuff that, that we haven't covered on a midterm. Good question. Okay. So let's start talking about algorithms. And this is something that we talked about at the very beginning of the semester and that we haven't really been as focused on, but now we're turning a page and we're coming back to it. So an algorithm is a series of rules or steps that I use to solve a problem. Particularly to solve a problem using a computer. Now, computer algorithms are a subset of algorithms. You guys implement algorithms. You don't always realize it. You have an algorithm for, you know, like coming in and sitting down in class or finding a seat or whatever. You know, the, you guys implement algorithms in your daily lives. But interest in this topic has spiked because of our ability to solve problems using computers. To implement algorithms, to get computers to solve useful problems, we're gonna apply the same type of problem-solving strategies that we've already been using. We're gonna perform simple calculations, we're going to store results, we're gonna make simple decisions, and we're gonna repeat things over and over. There's one or two more tools in our toolkit that we will introduce as we start to talk about this, including recursion, which is a way of breaking problems down into smaller pieces, but fundamentally, you've seen a lot of the components that we're gonna use as we start talking about sorting and searching and things like this, right? These are, these are not, these are built on top of ideas that should not be unfamiliar to you. We're also gonna be talking about data structures throughout the rest of the class. So what's a data structure? Data structure is some collection of data values where I can establish relationships among them. The main data structure we've been talking about so far is the array. Arrays establish a relationship between items that are enclosed in them. And you might think about, for example, the example we just did of the maximum. You know, sometimes you get so, arrays become so internalized that you stop realizing how useful they are. Because one of the things that array does within that loop is it allows me to separate the items I've already looked at from the items I haven't looked at yet. So that's one of the ways that arrays structure data in a way that allows me to do things like find a maximum value. So we're, as we talk about algorithms, we're also gonna be implementing some new data structures. And again, this is, this is built on top of ideas and concepts that we've already looked at. So we know how to store data in Java. 
using either primitive types or objects if there's a couple of values that are related to each other. Um, we have existing data structures, primarily arrays, that we're gonna utilize. Um, and object references are frequently going to allow us to establish relationships between two different pieces of data. So in a lot of the data structures we start looking at, we're gonna have a single object class that we design, but that class is gonna have references to other classes, sometimes to other instances of itself. That's what allows us to build lists. That's what allows us to build trees. That's what allows us to build maps. These two topics, as we talk about them, are heavily in intertwined and highly complementary. You know, so I've always felt that there's, there's no, there should be no such thing as a course on data structures. Because data structures don't exist in a vacuum. You don't create trees because it's fun. It's like, ooh, okay, I can put objects into a pretty picture by, it's like there's no reason to do that. The reason we implement data structures is to support algorithms. And as we go and we talk about algorithms, we're gonna show you how those algorithms are utilizing various features of the underlying data structures. So algorithms are usually really frequently driving this train. I just wanna point that out. A lot of times we create a particular kind of data structure or maintain it in a particular way because it allows us to run a particular type of algorithm on it. So for example, we maintain a sorted list of values because it makes searching for a value much faster. Or we maintain items in a tree because it makes searching for an item much faster. These are both examples of taking a problem that we want to solve and realizing that if we structure data in a particular way, it allows us to realize a much more efficient implementation of that particular problem. And along the way, we're gonna continue to use these imperative and object-oriented ideas, so we get lots of practice. And there's a couple of places where we're gonna sprinkle in some new ideas, particularly some of these uh, slightly more advanced Java object-oriented design principles and we'll see how those work, right? We'll see how those allow us in a lot of the same way that we just talked about. So we just implemented a maximum function that can work on thousands of different Java objects. We'll implement a list that can store any type of Java object. We can implement trees that store any type of Java object. We'll implement a hash table that can store any type of Java object. But we'll start to introduce some ideas that allows us to do that a little bit more safely. Okay. So let me talk about, so there's one trade-off that we're, we're going to be making here, and this is sort of inherent to um, the world of computer programming and to the modern world of uh, computers that you guys have sort of found yourselves a part of. Let me use an example to illustrate this. So greatest common divisor, greatest common denominator. Did you guys do this on MP0? I think that was last semester. Yeah, I think we did LCM this semester on MPC. This is pretty similar, right? So it's de defined as, you know, over a set of integers, two or more, and it's the largest positive integer that divides each one of those integers. Greatest common denominator. So there are complicated methods for computing the GCD, and this is primarily because there are certain types of calculations done in computer science where Computing the GCD is a building block that's used in those calculations, and if it's slow, the entire computation is also slow. And so there are sophisticated ways to solve this problem. You go on Wikipedia, you can find English language descriptions of these algorithms and try to implement them if you want. It's kind of fun. But one of the things as a systems person that I'm going to uh, remind you of is that there's a trade-off when we start talking about algorithms between doing something that is sophisticated and extremely fast and might get you a little bit of a performance improvement and something that is simple and easy to understand. So there's a famous electronics design course at Harvard that I took when I was there, and the people that teach it talk about the fact that a lot of times in electronics you have a choice between building a circuit that is simple and that you can get right and that will work 99% of the time. And then building another circuit that is much more expensive, much more complicated, much more difficult to get to work properly, 
that will work 100% of the time, if you can do it properly. We see the same trade-off in computer science all the time, between an approach to a problem that is easy for someone to understand, straightforward, um, might not perform optimally, and putting a lot of time and energy into something in order to make it go a little bit faster. And what this one of the kinds of trade-offs we'll be talking about as we talk about algorithms. So if I don't want to go, you know, on Wikipedia and look up sophisticated uh, ways to implement GCD and spend several days trying to get them to work, what's a simple way to find the greatest common denominator of two numbers? Yeah. No, that's a complicated way. Yeah, the simple, simple possible way. Yeah, so remember what we did with least common multiple? We started, and we just sort of iterated. We said, is this the least common multiple? No, okay, I'll try a slightly larger number. Is this the least common multiple? No, I'll try a slightly larger number. So I can do the same thing here with GCD. I can start with the s uh, smaller of the two, because the larger can't be the GCD, and I work my way downward, one value at a time. And yeah, so I try to divide both of them by it, or I can, on Java, I can use the remainder operator. If the remainder operator is zero, I'm done. If the remainder operator is not zero, I try a smaller number, and I continue until I get to a number that I know will divide both numbers, which is one. Yeah. So this is something that's sometimes known as a brute force solution. You can kind of understand why that is. I used to review papers for somebody, and I don't know who this person is because those papers were anonymous, who would, who would always refer to this as a brutal force solution, okay? It's not a brutal force solution. You're not trying to kill the problem, right? You just want to solve it, but you're kind of dumb. So you solve it in this brute, way. so it's that brute force, not brutal force. Do not apply brutal force to your MPs or homework problems. Um, so a brute force solution and we'll see some of these as we go, that's why I want to do this terminology, is a general technique that essentially involves trying a lot of different solutions and seeing if they work. So with the GCD, what we're doing is I start with, you know, again, the uh, minimum of the two numbers. I test if it's the GCD. If it's not, I try another value. I'm not doing a sophisticated comp uh, computation in order to try to figure out what the correct result should be I'm relying on the fact that I can test values to see if they are GCD. I have a simple test for that. I basically just compute the remainder with both values, right? And if I start at the largest number that could be the GCD and work downwards, and I keep applying my test, the first time it passes, I'm confident that I found the largest number that divides both evenly. So this is something to keep in mind today, because computers have gotten incredibly fast, this has started to stop, which is interesting in and of itself, but you have been born into this incredible wealth of computer power. And as much as you might disdain them from time to time or worry about their personal hygiene habits, you should really thank the people in ECE for this. Because I'm serious. They are the ones who gave us this bounty. Like, they are the ones who created this. There were years and years and years in which computers got faster at this incredible rate. Just nothing like it has ever happened in human history. That's what created the age that we live in. That has stopped, largely. Now, I hope, well, I doubt that even within my lifetime we're gonna notice that that has stopped. But again, it's, it's, there's really just no equivalent for it, and it's one of those things that's almost beyond your ability to comprehend in terms of how much computing power we've created over the past couple decades due to these incredible advancements in computer hardware, transistor technologies, et cetera, right? That has given you this incredible gift that you should go out and, and use. One of the things, ways that you can use that gift is you don't have to be too clever all the time. So frequently, and again, I come from a computer systems background, so this is something that computer systems people think about a lot. 
you know, on a sophisticated system that's got, you know, millions of lines of code like Linux, nobody is going to be okay with you trying something complicated that might break, particularly if it doesn't map, right? So one of the ways sometimes that you can approach problems when you're thinking about them from a more practical perspective is to say, I'm gonna try something easy that I can understand, that I can explain to somebody else, and that I can convince myself works. If that works, and nobody notices the fact that it's a little bit slow, then I'm done. If it doesn't, and if it's slowing my entire system down, then I might have to come back to it and fix it. So as systems go through multiple generations of development, frequently what happens is, it's like, oh, okay, well, first nobody was using our app, now everybody's using our app, so it's creating a lot of pressure on certain parts of our system. Now we have to go in and find all those little inefficiencies that we put in at the beginning because we were trying to get things done and we didn't want to do something in a really complicated way, and now we'll try to do something a little bit smarter. Okay. Let's not do this. This is, we'll, we'll come back and do this next time. We'll talk a little bit about it. So th but this is a way to do it, right? I think the point of this example was to show you that even if you do the brute force GCD, you can't see it. Like, you just can't see the amount of time it takes to run. Like, we can do the GCD of those two numbers at the bottom there, um, and you will not see the computer slow down. Now, one of the reasons that we care about GCD as a problem is that there are cases where I'm computing the greatest common denominator of two massive numbers. And in those cases, you will start to see this approach not work very well. Okay, brute force solutions. And again, this is a great thing. This is, you know, standing on top of decades worth of progress in this field um, and being able to take advantage of that, right? Use this to do good things and get stuff done, right? Um, you can always come back and change things later. But we're gonna talk in this class about aspects of speed and performance, particularly when we talk about algorithms, that you might not be able to see. So again, some of the, you know, when we get to sorting and searching and we implement slightly more sophisticated algorithms, on the type of inputs that we're gonna be experimenting with, you will never notice. It'll be like, oh, I spent an hour working on this really nice quick sort implementation, and then I ran it, and then, yeah, whatever, you know, it didn't get any faster. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it didn't get any faster because it's so fast already. But there are cases where we are gonna start to care about performance, right? Um, oop, sorry, wrong way. So this is one of those cases and I feel this way frequently, if I write code that makes my computer slow, I feel very dumb, because my computer is incredibly fast. And so I must be doing something really, really brain dead. And so sometimes you, you improve the performance of things simply because you're like, wait, you know, something here doesn't compute. I have this, in, this, this computer that can do billions of things per second, and it's still taking like five minutes to do this calculation. I must be doing something really, really stupid. So I'll go fix that. At some point, when you start your startup and people start to use what you've created, um, you may start looking at a build from a cloud service provider like Amazon or Google Cloud. And those numbers may start to bother you. And you may start to say, hey, you may go to your engineers and say, you know what, like, can we make this a little bit more efficient? Because if we make it more efficient, you know, when you only have 10 people using your app, Making it more efficient doesn't make that big of a difference. Once you have 10 million people, or like Facebook, billions of people using what you've created, then you start to care. Customers may tell you that your program is too slow. Again, you know, like, this, this, this is a problem. People run into this. Or one of the more common cases uh, where uh, speed matters or being able to talk about sophisticated app is that you're in a job interview. Um, and someone says, okay, you implemented the brute force solution to, you know, searching for a value. Show me how you can do it more efficiently, right? Okay. So let's talk about, we're gonna use this specific algorithm as an example for today, and we'll come back and start generalizing some of these ideas on Wednesday. So let's think about how long our brute force GCD algorithm is going to take to run. So remember, what I'm doing here, I'm starting at the minimum of the two values and I'm working my way downward. I test each value to see if it's the GCD, 
by computing the remainder with all of the values that I'm trying to find the GCD over. And if they're all zero, I'm done. If they're not all zero, I continue trying smaller and smaller values. So let's look at some specific cases. How about four and six? GCD of four and six is what? Two? So if I started at four, I would try four. Four is not the GCD. I would try three. Three is not the GCD. I would try two. So essentially, I've, I've taken three steps, okay? It's not too, doesn't sound too bad. What about 185 and 245? Is anyone, is anyone one of those math prodigies that can tell me what the GCD of these two numbers is? Or they can use a calculator, probably, quickly. Yeah. Mi I'm gonna start at the minimum value, right? Maximum value can't be the GCD, so, yeah. Ah, okay, apparently the GCD is five, thank you. Um, so how many values would I have tested here? Where do I start? I start at 185, and then I go to 184, and I could do like a great performance art piece if I actually just stood here and went through all the numbers until we got to five. That's what we're gonna do on Wednesday. Um, anyway, but I've tested, by that point, like roughly 185 numbers, okay? So for four and six, I had to test three numbers, for 185, I tested actually like 181, starting at 185 and including five. What about if I give you a general case? What if I say, compute the GCD of M and N, and I don't tell you what those numbers are? Who can give me an estimate? Yeah, so let's talk about best and worst case scenarios. That's one of the things we start to talk about when we talk about algorithm analysis. So what's the best case scenario here? No, worst case. Best case, yeah. Yeah, so the best case is that the GCD is either M or N. Imagine that this is five and 10. Then the minimum is the GCD. So in the best case, I test one number. What about the worst case? In the worst case, what's the GCD? For this algorithm, the worst case is? If it's one. So if it's one, I have to test the minimum of M and N times. So I start with the minimum of the two and I go downward, and so I'm gonna test all of them all the way down, okay? So this, this is where we're gonna wrap up today and we'll pick up the rest of the slides on Wednesday. And what we've been doing today is an example of something called algorithm analysis. And this is something that we will do interspersed with bits of time implementing things and running them and kind of poking at them and, and seeing about how they actually perform. We're gonna analyze algorithms. This is something that you will continue to do as you take 173, 374, 225, and courses like that. And this is one, again, this is one of those things, understanding how algorithms perform. The trade-offs involved in choosing one is one of the things that makes you a computer scientist. There are many different things that we might be concerned about when we talk about a particular algorithm and how it works. And one of the things that makes algorithms fun to talk about is that there are a lot of trade-offs, particularly once you talk, start thinking about different resources that an algorithm uses. So an algorithm implemented on a computer uses time. It takes a certain amount of time to run. It needs a certain amount of computer instructions to complete. An algorithm implemented on a computer also consumes memory. There's part of the computer's memory that's going to be utilized by the algorithm while it runs. And if that amount is enormous, that can cause problems. It might also need other resources. It might need disk space. It might use the network or whatever. But for the, the purposes of this class, the two that we're really gonna be focusing on are time and memory. So we're gonna talk about how long an algorithm takes to run, that's our primary focus. We'll also think a little bit about how much memory space, how much working space it needs as it goes. Okay, I have a couple of announcements. 
So as a reminder, and before early deadline is today at five. I am receptive to the idea of extending that slightly because GitHub has been down for reasons I don't understand. Um, I have office hours starting essentially right now in my office. Those are gonna be a regular thing now. Come by if you wanna chat. Um, thanks to those who have provided feedback using the anonymous form. I've started to respond to that on the forum. You can cer certainly keep it coming. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Good luck getting started on MP4.